Sambal Bhai and Sudhin Ji for taking the and supporting this initiative for the discussion. Uh, the point being that one of the uh, efforts that we are trying to make is for the peace movements of India, of South Asia, which we are working on, but the larger uh, alliances that we need to have with our friends in West Asia and the struggles that they are undertaking. Uh, there are a number of videos that we will do at the end, but uh, we will run through this lecture uh, where I compile a lot of information from Western sources about where this ISIS has come from, number one. And the second point being that where do the roots of the Syrian crisis or the entire West Asian crisis go? How far do they actually go? Okay. Uh, we have had a number of statements from okay. the reason why I have given in this title is essentially the contradiction between the art of the resistance and the collaborators of the colonial occupation powers. The point being that the entire crisis in the Middle East is being reduced to one between Sunni and Shia. And that is not the entire story. Apart from it, certainly, it's not to deny that this contradiction does exist. But is it the only contradiction? Is it the reason for the entire crisis in the Middle East or other other factors? So on one hand, you have the art of the resistance, in which you have Syria, you have Iraq, you have Iran, you have Yemen, you have Palestine, you have Lebanon. It is Sunnis and Shias together, you have Palestinians and Kurds and Druze and uh, you know, it's Christians on this side and you have uh, the South Iraq forces on the other side. So it's not that it's uh, some clear dividing line of two uh, sectarian camps battling each other. So the forces that are essentially fighting for the sovereignty or the independence of the nations. So essentially, the larger headline is that those forces that are fighting for the sovereignty and the independence of their nations and those that are willing to remain as pliant vassal states, as collaborators of the imperial project. That is what this basic contradiction is about. Now it was way back last year when we heard about ISIS on the 10th of June when all of a sudden within a few hours the Iraqi army collapsed and Mosul was taken over. That was the first time we began to hear of uh, the power of ISIS and then they're going into one major army. So where does it actually come from? Castro, way back, sorry. So Castro had come out with a very damning indictment and he said that he compared NATO to the Nazis and slammed the Americans and the Israelis for creating ISIS. And there is enough evidence for that. Then you had the US uh, General McCurney and we have the video, we'll show it to you later. He said, we helped create the ISIS. This year we had a very important report that was released to the media. None of them carried it here. But the US Defense Intelligence Agency, which is part of the Pentagon, came out with a report saying that we foresaw the rise of the ISIS way back in 2002 and the creation of a Salafist principality in Syria. This was within their understanding, within their domain, way back in 2012. And basically saying that the overwhelming core of the Syrian insurgency at the time was dominated by a range of Islamist militant groups, including the Al-Qaeda in Iraq. So they knew who they were helping, who, who they were supplying the weapons to. This information was with them. Now, how far this conflict goes? Does it go up to 2011 when there was a democratic uprising, or do the plans for Syria go back far more, deeper? Julian Assang quotes weekly cables which of 2006, which basically say that the roots for the regime change agenda in Syria go back to 2006. And they were going to use the Sunni Shiite uh, fault lines to 
get that agenda in place. It was way back in 2009 that Roland Dumas, ex foreign minister of France, we have the video again, where he came across his British counterparts who told him that we are preparing to send British forces into Syria to bring about regime change. So what exactly is happening out here? Okay, then we have a United Nations report which says that Israel is supporting the ISIS. Now what is Israel supporting the Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State of Syria and Levant or Iraq for? Okay. Now this is a United Nations UNDOF report of 12 pages. Charles Risto is another study expert and he said that the Syrian insurgency was basically being coordinated with the Al-Qaeda. We knew it was the Al-Qaeda and from 2012 onwards we have, uh, the CIA was coordinating with them. Now we come to the key reasons why we have this problem. We'll just go through this map first. It's necessary to understand this map and then we go through the four reasons for this problem. For India, it's important because the flames have come to Pakistan, as you all know, and all the way to Palestine and to Libya, and it goes down now into Nigeria and Kenya. It is just spreading and it goes all the way to Ukraine. Essentially, First reasons are the ones that we know of is the question of the pipelines, the question of the oil reserves. In 2006-07, major oil reserves have been found in the eastern Mediterranean, in the coastlines of Syria, Cyprus, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine. All these countries stand to gain from the oil and gas reserves found in the eastern Mediterranean. So it's a matter of who controls the oil, who, who sits in Damascus is the question. That is one issue. The second point being is the battle over two pipelines. There are two pipelines battling it out for supplying the gas to Europe. One is the Iran, Iraq, Syria pipeline going via Turkey to Europe and the other is the Qatar, Saudi pipeline going via Syria to Europe. These are the two pipelines that are battling it out. And Qatar offered uh, Syria that option that you step out of the Iran axis, you come along with us and uh, be part of the new alliance with NATO actually. Assad refused. Uh, and so in 2006, actually the turning point which WikiLeaks traced goes back to 2006. In the month of July 11th when Israel attacked Lebanon after a 34 day war the Lebanese resistance led by the Hezbollah and by the communists and the nationalist forces of uh, uh, Lebanon, they managed to defeat the Israelis by stopping them at the border. Go back to 1967 when the Arab armies were defeated in six days and Arab capitals were taken over. But after a 34 day war, a 20,000 strong uh, Israeli army with tanks and fighter planes and navy, they could not defeat the Hezbollah. So in 2006, you have a clear alliance between the Israelis and the Saudis happening and very openly. And this is spelled out in an article which I'll come to by Samor Hirsch. So one was the oil and the gas issue, the battle of the pipelines, which you can see. Uh, I'll come to this map as well. Uh, the point was that after the war of 2006, Syria was given 
certain options by the West. This very Bashar al-Assad was invited to Paris as a liberal reformist. He was the chief guest at the French Republic Day. Okay, thank you. 2007, Bashar al-Assad was invited to the French Republic Day as a chief guest and there he was given the option of becoming part of the Qatari Saudi pipeline. The sanctions on Syria would end, but Syria would have to not only become part of the pipeline, but stop supporting the Palestinian resistance. In that, even Israel would hand over Golan Heights to Syria. To that extent, the discussions were taking place. Assad refused. Assad refused and said that I cannot abandon the Palestinian resistance, nor can I abandon my old allies, be it Iran or Russia for the matter. Okay. This map is, of course, very interesting. We'll come to it. But it is about the oil smuggling that is taking place from Syria and Iraq. It goes to Turkey and from the port of Seyan it goes to Israel. So the Deir Azor is the main place where the oil from Syria is being siphoned out by the ISIS. Then you have the same thing happening in Iraq and from there it's going all the way into Turkey and from there to Israel. Of course there are buyers in Europe and America and so on and uh, so forth but uh, this is how the entire ISIS uh, terror factory is being uh, funded. So there's an important article on this. I'll, I think this information can be sent out to people over here. But now there is the other pipeline battle taking place in Europe, in Eastern Europe between the Russians and NATO on the other hand. But it is the crisis of Ukraine. So the crisis of Ukraine emerged in 2014 and where, Amer uh, where the isolation of Putin was put into place, sanction on Russia so that uh, the Russian uh, pipelines from the south, the, the Russians were trying to build a pipeline, one is which one that goes to Germany, but they wanted one down from south, so they would stop depending on the, the key NATO countries. But that was when the entire Ukrainian uh, crisis emerged. The point being that if The point being that if the Iranian reserves which have been released now after the uh, sanctions on Iran, on the nuclear deal, and the Russians get together, they control 50% of the gas supplies to Europe. And the Americans are trying to stop all that they can in terms of at least neutralizing uh, the Russian supplies to Europe. Okay. Uh, the oil, the pipelines, but that is not the entire story. The largest story is about the Israeli plan for the region. The Israeli plan is for a greater Israel. It is Israel from the Nile to the Euphrates. And here you have this discussed openly in the media now. And we had what was called the Oded Yenon Plan of 1982, an open document. It's not a you know, a hidden document. This was a public document released by the Israelis in 1982 where the Greater Israel Project was discussed, where the final solution for them was the total ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian population and the spread of Israeli power from the Nile in Egypt to the Euphrates in Iraq and the ethnic cleansing of the various communities from these areas. The second document which must be read is called a clean break strategy for securing the realm by Benjamin Netanyahu. This again says that Oslo was a defeat for Zionism and the peace plan cannot be adhered to. What Israel needs to do is reorganize the map of the region. Just imagine what they're saying. And what it meant was essentially partitioning Arab and Muslim countries along the various religious, ethnic and sectarian fault lines. It could be a Christian Muslim division in Egypt. It would be a Kurdish Arab division in Iraq. It could be a Sunni Shia division in Iraq and Syria. But all the basic fault lines that existed needed to be hit on and these countries partitioned and divided. And the third important document is what is called the Project for the New American Century, again released in 97 which says that 
there's no power that exists now that America is the only superpower. The 21st century will be the American century. And it lays down a blueprint about how America would be the hegemonic power, which they call total global dominance in the 21st century. This is the map of Greater Israel, stretching all the way from Egypt to Iraq and Syria. And that is why you see the larger war that is again occurring in this region. After 9-11, uh, General Wesley Clark, that video is again there with us, said that there was a memo in the White House that said that after 9-11, seven countries had to be taken out in five years. And those countries were Iraq, Libya, Somalia, Syria, Lebanon, Sudan, and ending with Iran. Iraq is in a state of disarray. It's, it's a collapsed state. Libya is now partitioned with Al-Qaeda and ISIS holding towns and cities. Somalia with, with, uh, with again a, you know, a failed state. Syria is facing a war. Uh, a lot, large part of the country has been destroyed. Lebanon is just holding on. It could deteriorate into a civil war. Sudan has been partitioned. And Iran, uh, for now, is surrounded and facing war if the Israelis would have the way, and the Saudis as well. And in that context, there's a very important article which appeared in 2007, by, written by Semora as a Pulitzer, uh, uh, Pulitzer winner. It's a very prophetic article. It should be read by all of us, the ones who are concerned with West Asia and understanding it better. That article calls it, uh, it's about the redirection of American foreign policy. Way back in 2007, Semoros writes that now American foreign policy will be redirected with the Bush administration and will carry on with the coming administrations. And it basically talks of creating a Saudi-Turkish-Israeli bloc against the arc of the resistance. They like to call it the Shiite arc, but I refuse to call it that because I basically call it the arc of the resistance against the colonial collaborator vassal states. So, because the attack, the war on Iraq finally changed the balance of power, which they did not intend to, but anybody who could have gone into Iraq could have foreseen that finally it would have changed the balance of power. Now, Saddam, as a secular dictator, did a lot of good things for that country. But at the same time, the biggest mess that he created for the region was Saddam's war on Iran. He ruined Iraq. And Iraq could not stand up after that disastrous war on Iran. The Iran could stand up, but Iraq carried on to collapse within, with the UN sanctions, with the divisions within, and all that happened. And finally, uh, Iraq was too weak to uh, take on the the war that the Americans launched for them in 2003. And again, be it the war of 1991, when uh, Iraq was invaded uh, for the first time by Bush senior, Syria was the only Arab country that did not take part in that war. And again in 2003, when the Arab alliance along with NATO invaded Iraq, Syria was not part of that war. So there has been something to do with Syria in terms of standing with the resistance and not getting enmeshed in the NATO agenda for the region. So this article by Semorosh is very important uh, to be read. It starts with, of course, in Tunisia, and Tunisia is the only country that has been able to deal with the situation in a, in a political way, because there is a balance that the secular and the centrist forces and in the Islamists have tried to negotiate and tried to move towards a parliamentary democracy. Even the constitution is progressive in terms of equal rights for citizens and women's rights, workers' rights. It's, it's largely a progressive document as far as the Arab world is concerned. It's, it's, it's actually a, it's quite a good constitution. But the other countries have not been able to deal with it. Now, it, the next theater of war we saw, was, saw was in Libya, where we had this entire anti-Gaddafi propaganda. Again, I say that Gaddafi was a, a dictator, undoubtedly. But at the same time, Libya was a very advanced welfare state. Uh, the, it was on par with any country in Europe in terms of what was being done for the people with the old resources. It was Gaddafi 
who was instrumental for the creation of the African Union. And 90% of the oil that was even pumped out by the multinationals was actually owned by the Libyan state. The Libyan state actually controlled 90% of the oil reserves, which the Western powers really did not like. And most of the oil wealth was going to his people. The other thing that Gaddafi was moving towards was the creation of an African currency, uh, a common uh, African currency in the, in, uh, denominated with, with a gold standard. This was finally the key to finishing of Gaddafi, the entire propaganda against Gaddafi, and then where China and Russia actually made a mess by not vetoing the Americans in the United Nations Security Council, where the uh, no-fly zone was allowed, and then Al-Qaeda and ISIS were actually sent into uh, Libya. You will see photographs of the leader of Al-Qaeda with uh, John McCain uh, in this uh, lecture. So after Libya was destroyed, from that theater of war, Al-Qaeda and ISIS were airlifted into Turkey. Weapons from Libya were airlifted to Turkey. Turkey became the main base of operations. Then came NATO weapons from Zagreb in Croatia. And from Turkey, this entire war began to spill over into Syria.